Hello and welcome to Ron Whitlock Reports. I'm your host, Ron Whitlock. Our guest in the studio today, Gilberto Hinojosa, a Democratic National Committee man from South Texas, Dr. Tony Knopp, a retired professor from the University of Texas, and Father Mike Seifert of San Felipe de Jesus Catholic Church. Thank you for joining us. The 44th President of the United States will be sworn into office on January the 12th at noon. 2009, Barack Obama, whose mother white, father African American, is going to be the next occupant of the White House. The People's President, Gilberto Hinojosa. What does that mean? Well, it means that um, you're not going to see an administration like you've seen in the last eight years. You're going to see an administration that's, uh, I think the words that you use, and I, and I think they're right, they, they're not beholden to anyone except the American people. You know, they're not going to have... Came forward on the internet, right. contributed on the internet, Yeah, K Street, Wall Street. There's not going to be any preferred people other than the American public in that administration. Lobbyists, think, bundlers. They're not going to be allowed no in, to work in the administration. You're going to see um, I issues uh, being handled based upon solely on what's in the best interest. You're not going to have these little special committees made up of, you know, Exxon and and all the oil companies to decide the oil policies or the fuel uh, the energy policy of the United States. You're going to see ordinary Americans who know about these issues. Uh, that doesn't sound all bad to me, well, Doctor. Not that sounds rather appealing, but the question is whether it will be able to actually function that way. For example, uh, Obama may try to keep the lobbyists out of his administration, but they're going to be there at Congress. If the Democrat-controlled Congress will... That infrastructure has just been there way exactly. too long. Well, except the difference this time is this, is that you have a president that's, that's walking into the White House with 348 electoral votes. It's a landslide. It's a mandate. And then he's, he's coming in with a much stronger uh, uh, Congress that is, that is elected, I think, on his coattails primarily. And so his ability to influence what that Congress does is probably going to be greater than what you've seen with any president in a long, long time. And so I think that, that the direction that the country takes, the legislation that is presented to him, is going to be legislation that he's going to have a lot more influence over than what you've seen with other presidents because you know he is going to be in the driver's seat, uh, at least at the beginning of this administration. And you're going to see and he's going to shine the spotlight on, a, on those members of Congress that decide to ignore uh, the mandate of the American people, which is they want to change, they're tired of the way business has been done in Washington, D.C. for a long time. And, and, and if they don't change, they're going to meet the fate of the Republicans, uh, that the, the, the fate that the Republicans met this last uh, election. So I think there's going to be an enormous amount of pressure in Congress to pull away for the old, from the old way of doing business because of what happened in this election, because of what happened in 2006, and because you've got a president probably that's smarter than any person that's been in that White House uh, since uh, Thomas Jefferson was there, you know, 200 years ago. I think it's clear that there was a, uh, a movement to uh, support a Democratic Congress before there was any real decision about uh, Barack Obama. So I think Congress is going to feel somewhat independent, or at least the leaders in Congress, somewhat independent of, uh, of Obama to that extent. I think they'll be willing to follow his lead in the programs that he's proposed because they're basically programs that the Democrats in Congress have supported or would support. Uh, but I, I don't think that it's going to have quite the dramatic change that uh, some people may be anticipating. The biggest thing, I think, is the fact is so many, so many candidates who did win this time knocking out incumbents, they are on the Obama coattails. He did take some of the $600, $700 million that he got off predominantly off the Internet, spread it across all 50 states, had a 50-state strategy as opposed to strictly battleground type strategy, and he did that predominantly in areas where he really wanted to have coattails, to have those people with him when he went to the Congress and said, I need your vote on this. He, had, so the on money, that, he had the money to do it. So There's no that, question there. But correct. I would disagree with you about the battleground strategy. I think there was a strong, that's where he was. He was in the battleground states. That's where the contest was. 
At this point in time, where does the Lone Star State stand, fellas? Where does the border area, Latinos in the Southwest, what do we think that they can look forward to out of an Obama presidency? Here's the way I see it. Um, four years ago, if you take the state of Virginia, for example, it was not expected that Virginia would turn to a Democratic state anytime soon. You had one Republican uh, 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 senator, uh, a Republican governor. I think George Bush won by a large margin, somewhere like 14 percentage points in the last uh, presidential election. Now, in that state, you have a Democratic governor, two Democratic senators, and Barack Bo uh, Obama won by a, 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 a safe margin in that state. It has become a Democratic state. I think uh, Barack Obama and the Democrats in Congress see Texas as the next state that turns blue. What, what happened in this election on November the 4th is that the margin of difference between the Democrats and the Republicans was smaller than the margin of difference in 2004 in Virginia. So the Democrats and Barack Obama see Texas as close to becoming blue very soon. Every urban area, Harris County now is Democrat, Dallas County is now Democrat, Tarrant County is Democrat, Bear County is Democrat, Travis County is Democrat, every, every er, urban area is Democrat today. So what's going to happen is that this administration sees that Texas has the potential of turning blue. They're going to put resources, time, they're going to make appointments out of the state of Texas because they want to show the people in the state of Texas that it pays to be a blue state. Only Fort Worth and Corpus Christi went for McCain. That All other metropolitan areas in the Lone Star State went for Obama. That's right. And, and, and the other part of it is this. I think the administration is going to say, the Barack administra Obama administration is going to say, we have a potential to make a change if we put the, an amount, the resources into that area if, uh, in order to show that we support the agenda of the people of the st state of Texas. And South Texas is one of the areas where they're going to focus it. The second issue is this. You have a socially conscious administration today like you've never seen before. This administration does not believe in the two Americas. This administration believes that you should not have an area like South Texas without uh, adequate health care, that you should not have a community without a that doesn't have the ability to pick itself up because it doesn't have access to an interstate highway. It doesn't, it doesn't believe that uh, a community should have a 50% uh, of poverty rate. So they're going to be pumping resources into this community to make it right because they're, they believe in it. Immigration reform, one of the main drivers of Latino Hispanic voters to go to the polls. Those numbers were down from the Bush years because of immigration reform. Even a major spokesman for the McCain campaign said nationally that the reason that McCain saw a slippage of Latino Hispanic voters was because of the rhetoric of the GOP over the last few years as it relates to immigration reform, even though it was McCain who carried the ball in immigration reform, gets worker and those things, doesn't matter, he still took the wrath of Latino Hispanic voter. In the satellite interview I had with Barack Obama and talking to him about immigration reform, he said he wanted to work with Mexico, improve the circumstance in Mexico, business-wise, for jobs creation, to keep those people from necessarily having to come for jobs to support their families to the United States of America. Immigration reform, based on Dave Beckwith, one of the major GOP runners behind the scenes as it relates to K. Bill Hutchison and John Cornyn told South Texas that it's going to be the first year of the Obama administration where immigration reform is going to be done or not done. You think he's going to be able to get it done, and what will it look like? Well, uh, for, for one thing, the pressure is somewhat uh, diminished about the whole issue of immigration reform because of the declining numbers of people coming into the United States as well as many of the people returning because of the economic situation in the United States right now. That moves it down the list a ways. It's, it's still an issue, you know, and it's important to those people who are involved in it, but it's no longer going to have quite the same national impact that it's had in the past. And I, I tend to agree that if, if they don't tackle it in the first year, uh, they're probably not going to tackle it at all. Uh, I think it's important that they come to grips with this issue, however, and Obama now will have a chance if, to make good on the notion that something should be done about this. 
Uh, this is a worldwide recession. Everybody's suffering, including Mexico and South and Central America. You're going to continue to see a large stream of people coming into the United States. It is a problem that we have to deal with. There's 11 million, more than 11 million undocumented, uh, uh, undocumented workers in the United States, and something has to be done. A comprehensive immigration policy has to be passed. Um, and I think there's a Democratic Congress in place with a Democratic president that are prepared to do that. Hispanics, I don't think people understand. Everybody was looking at the African-American vote. But the swing states um, that the Hispanics carried were Nevada, New Mexico, and Iowa. There is not a large African-American population in any of those three states. And, and so to a large extent, uh, uh, Barack Obama understands, and in order for Texas to become a blue state, you need to have a, a large Hispanic turnout. You're right. The, the Hispanic population in this, sta in, this, in this country completely moved away from the Republican Party, and that was the main issue. It really was. And so I think this administration sees it not only as a social problem that needs to be corrected, an economic problem that needs to be dealt with, but it also sees it as a political problem that they need to resolve during the first administration. Whether it's the first year or the second year, it needs to be enacted quickly. And again, it's also an administration that's very socially conscious. They do not l like the idea that you've got this huge population of people in this country that are being treated like you know, second-class citizens. They believe very strongly that the way the Bush administration treated undocumented workers was wrong and that that all needs to change. And I think you're going to see those changes quickly in this administration. On January 25th, 2009, Barack Obama will become the 44th president of the United States, elected predominantly by young whites, blacks, 95% of the blacks voted for Barack Obama, 68% of Latinos voted for Barack Obama. So it was, had it, would it not be for the young white vote and for the Latino vote, Barack Obama could not have made it with only the, the African-American black vote that he got at the polls on November the 4th. But all the discussion of the first black president, the first black president, the first black president seems to be leaving out the people I'm talking to, those whites who voted for Barack Obama and those Latinos who voted for Barack Obama. They want to feel like they received something for their vote also. Is he making a mistake? Is the media making a mistake by talking so much about the fact that he's black this, black that, and leaving out the fact that at least half of his genes are white genes, and others voted him into office at the White House. Well, he, he spent uh, n nine months in the womb of a, of a white woman. He was raised by white grandparents. Um, uh, his name was Barry uh, uh, Obama in, in, in until he became a politician. I mean, look. But the yeah, national media Bar never talked about that. Barack I heard one pundit mention the fact it's, that it's, he was a mixed race candidate. It's like Colin Powell said. This morning, he said, Barack Obama is a brilliant uh, uh, public servant who happens to be black. And I think that's what's important here. You're right. Th that, that focus it needs to be directed in, at another thing. It's, it's not about him being an African American. It's about his ability to appeal to a broad spectrum of people in this country. And, well, no, and yeah. he's nobody's fool. Yeah. He knows that it, it, his position does not depend just on the black vote, which is automatically there for the Democratic candidates anyway. You're going to see in his administration a lot of whites and some Latinos appointed to and office. Republicans. And Republicans. And even maybe occasional Republicans. He's already appointed Rahm Emanuel, his chief of a staff. A shrewd choice who is Brilliant a move. congressman from, from Illinois and who is a white, by the way. So he's already started off with his first appointment not necessarily being an African-American. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think you're going to see a very diverse administration. I mean, he's, he's looking to ensure to, that he has, uh, it's like, it, it, this is almost deja vu all over again in the words of Yogi Berra. Uh, 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 JFK, he, he's bringing in the best and the brightest. He's bringing in an administration that is, that is going to, you're going to have some extremely intelligent, capable people in all uh, sectors who are, not, who are not necessarily with him from the very beginning, but who he believes will bring everybody together and come up with some new ideas to take us out of the ditch that we're in right now. In 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson achieve the Voting Rights Act, outlawing discrimination in voting, allowing millions of African American blacks and Latino Hispanics to vote for the first time. Did he, in fact, set up at that point 
the election of Barack Obama in the year 2008. Well, he certainly contributed to it. Uh, he was part, a major part, of the civil rights developments of that era. And uh, by pushing those acts through Congress, and something that uh, Kennedy hadn't been able to or wasn't committed to doing, uh, Johnson put on the books the laws that would open the gates for uh, a greater involvement in society on the part of blacks and to a certain extent Hispanics. And People in the Lone Star State of Texas saw their senator as being a very conservative senator, but yet, in fact he was quite a liberal president of the United States. He nominated civil rights attorney Thurgood Marshall to be the first African American associate of the Supreme Court. You know, uh, freedom is infectious. I mean, if you can, if you you touch someone with freedom, it just grows real quick. And I think what happened with with the 1964 Voting Rights Act is, or 65 Voting Rights Act, I can't remember what year it was, is that it opened up some doors that just blew open the moment they opened the, the cracks opened up. I mean, when you started having, for example, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that changed voting procedures and required Justice Department clearance of any voting procedure that might have a discriminatory effect, it just made it so much easier for African Americans and Hispanics uh, uh, to make it made it easier for them to go out and vote. Once they started voting, then it made it then easier for them to allow other people to participate in the political process. It's like I, I got I got a little poem in the uh, text today that said Rosa Parks sat so that Martin Luther King could walk. Martin Luther King walked so Barack Obama could run to allow our children to fly in the future. And that's really what it, it was that little door, little opening that allowed us to become uh, a strong nation um, uh, in the area of civil rights and, and have African Americans and, and Hispanics to participate in the process. And Willie Velasquez in Texas. Fellas, I must tell you, from my position as a journalist, dealing with almost all of the presidential candidates who had even a slight interest in voters in Texas, from Rudy Giuliani all the way down to at the final end being Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, the Barack Obama campaign treated me as a journalist with respect, with courtesy, with professionalism to the degree of none of the other candidates. If he treats the White House and the people and with the integrity, with the character that he treated this reporter, then I, can, I, will, I feel very comfortable about him going into the White House because if he runs the White House the way he ran his campaign, from the people that came to Brownsville in South Texas, McAllen, Edinburgh, wherever I was involved with the Barack Obama campaign, they did it perfectly. Well, you're the you micro heard. example. But the macro example, the large, broad example that you have uh, across the nation is what an effective campaign he ran, you know, everywhere. Very effective. And it wasn't just about money either because Hillary had a lot of money mm -hmm. and he beat Hillary. I mean, it's about smart thinking. Organized. And, and, and organized and, and using the money effectively mm -hmm. the, through the Internet, uh, all sorts of, of, of ways that we had never even thought of in politics. So. Roberto Hinojosa, when are you gonna land, going to announce that you're going to run for uh, re-election to be <laughs> county judge in Cameron County. Uh, uh, now that we're in that new I election I put him up cycle. to that. I'm he put me up to I'm it. Happy that's a non-answer. Being a <laughs> private citizen and helping good Democrats like Barack well, Obama. Well, has. we're into the new election uh, cycle, though. Are you giving uh, it some thought? I'm, I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I'm fighting the good fight wherever I can fight. I, I just, I was telling uh, uh, Father Seifert, I just got nominated to the ACLU Board of Directors in the state mm -hmm. of Texas, so we're, 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 we're working on a lot of good issues that are important to the people in South Texas. And I'm on the DNC, and I'm going to be working with the DNC and the Barack administration, uh, Obama administration, to make Texas a blue state. Okay, and joining us now, Father Mike Seifert, Pastor San Felipe of the Jesus Catholic Church. Father, thank you for joining mm -hmm. us. Thank you. We want to talk a little bit about President Johnson, how was President Johnson somewhat involved in where we are today based on what he did as President of the United States? I just finished reading a book I recommend to everybody by Taylor Branch. And he did a three-volume series. The last one is called Crossing to Canaan. And he speaks about mostly Johnson and his relationship with Martin Luther King. But the, the fascinating thing to me is that Johnson did not have to do the Great Society move. I mean, he, he, he did this. He, he took this and he knew what it was going to do to the Democratic Party. 
He said giving the right to vote to, to African Americans, opening it up to people, was going to cost the Democratic Party. I think he said three or four generations. Well, now we're in the fourth or fifth generation, and it's come full circle. And those people who did not have access to the vote before have had it the last two cycles. And that's, that's what we saw on November 4th. Young Latinos, African Americans, young people turning out with, with great energy, the kind of energy that, that this guy reflects in his book. It was, a, it was a new moment that was created. And Levin Johnson's heart really goes back to his first job out of uh, San Marcos College, and that was going to uh, Catula in South Texas and seeing the impoverishment and the lack of educational opportunity for Latinos and Hispanics in that very young stage of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson life. He carried that to the White House, and that's why he did what he did. Now, we wanted the father to come on board today. He is the pastor of Hilberto Hinojosa sitting next to him and talk about healing for the country because it was a very hard-fought campaign between McCain and Obama. What do we need to be all thinking about as it relates to the healing of the country and getting behind our president, Barack Obama? Well, I think speaking as a Christian, the first thing is that Christians are called to hope and not to fear. And what this country has struggled with since 9-11 since has been the tendency to run afraid, to be afraid. Uh, what happens? And if Carl we get, Rove and the Republican Party use that to their advantage to some degree. It's very easy to scare people, and I mean we we, we saw that in in the last the last presidential election with with um, the soccer moms, and and it does. You you, you put that little seed of doubt in people's hearts, and okay, we're going to go with the sure guy. So they went with with Bush. Now though, things have gotten so far along that I think people. I don't want to say out of desperation because I don't think that's the word. I think that people saw a reason for hope. And, and we saw that with the McCain campaign. They began to, 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 to preach the same message. And that resonates, again, with a Christian people. When we hear that over and over again in the Gospels, we're called to be people of hope, not fear. It's critical. So we're called to be basis, critical. We need to hope for a, for a successful Barack Obama presidency. Yeah, I think whoever got elected, we would all be praying a lot for because he has inherited a horrible job. And yet he's got a people, I think, who's behind him. I, well, I was really moved by both McCain's speech uh, on, on election night as well as Barack Obama's acceptance. They're both very powerful turns away from themselves and looking to the nation. I think they both wisely reflected the situation that we're in. And it was a, it was a call to arms in the best sense of the word. And, and I really appreciated Obama mentioning the call to sacrifice. And I hope he does that. I hope he asks of us a sacrifice, because I do think that's one thing that's missing in this nation. The problem that he faces is that these are immense issues that he has to tackle. I mean, the economy is in, in a state that we've not seen since the Great Depression. You know, we're internationally in a very difficult situation. And it's going to take all of us is what he said, for us to be able to resolve these. And that's why I think it's important that we all come together. Father Seifert, thank you for coming and joining us. Gilberto Hinoza, I'm going to always call you a judge, Democratic National Committee man. Thank you for joining us here on Ron Whitlock Reports. Till next time, adios. <laughs>